Our series for Lent is called Long Story Short, and over the course of Lent, we are taking in the whole story of God from beginning to end. We started with creation and the story of God investing this world with goodness and beauty. And as soon as, as we, the uh, people, humans, as soon as we enter that story, we see a conflict between our calling to enhance the goodness and beauty, to participate and bear fruit in the world, and our tendency to take what God has made, to take the beauty and the goodness of this world and to manipulate it and to use it for our own purposes. And over the course of history, God is in relationship with God's people through covenant, which enables us over time to begin to see how loving God really is. And then last week we talked about Christ and the way that he, he didn't just come to, to restore us to some kind of uh, to the perfection of Eden, but instead was continuing the work that God had long been doing and advancing it, moving it forward, not pulling us out of it, but inviting us into it as we follow Him. And so today, chapter 5 of 6 is the church. And so we read from Acts chapter 1. Let us listen together for the Word of God. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, by the power of your Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us that we might hear what you want us to hear, so that we can be who you want us to be and do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mildred was the church gossip, the self-appointed monitor of the church's morals, and she would always stick her nose into places that didn't belong. There were several members of the church who did not approve of Mildred's activities, but they feared her sufficiently not to say anything. She made a mistake, however, when she accused Frank, a new member, of being an alcoholic. You see, she had seen his car parked out in front of the town's only bar all afternoon. She emphatically told Frank and several others that everyone seeing his truck would know exactly what he was doing there. Frank was a man of few words. He stared at her for just a moment and then turned and walked away. He didn't explain, deny, or defend. He said nothing. Later that evening, Frank quietly parked his pickup in front of Mildred's house, walked home, (laughs) and left it there all night. I hope that story's true. (laughs) This is classic church drama, isn't it? (laughs) What is the church? Is it just a place where silliness like this actually is uh, acted out? Is it a, a quaint fixture of American life with familiar characters like Mildred and Frank? Is it just a group of people with with similar religious leanings, with similar cultural, moral values? What is the church? We usually look to Pentecost, that moment in Acts chapter 2, or actually it's chapter 1. It's later on in chapter 1, the day that people are all gathered together and the Spirit of God descends upon those who are gathered in tongues of fire and so forth, and we'll get there in several weeks. That's what the day that we look to as the beginning of the church, the birth of the church. In our story this morning, this hasn't happened yet. We are still pre-Pentecost. We are still pre-church. And this is where it really begins. 
There's no church yet, just a lot of uncertainty. So the disciples ask this question of Jesus. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? This is such an important question for them to be asking Jesus. Consider what they've just been through. Jesus has died. After this year or maybe three years of ministry in which they, the disciples, had given up everything. And they'd followed him around and they'd learned from him. And in all of that time, they were, they were building up these grand expectations of what was going to happen. Not just for Jesus, but for them. When Jesus becomes the king that they all know he's going to become. And then he dies. And it all comes to nothing. And then he's raised from the dead. And I know I'm going to get in trouble for talking about the resurrection during Lent, but it's an important part of the story. He is raised from the dead and with him their hopes. So now, Jesus, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? We thought it was going to be before, but then with all that death business, but now it's looking great. Now is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They still think Jesus came to restore their political fortunes. They still hope that Jesus has some special role in mind just for his disciples. They still don't see a difference between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God. And so far from seeing this moment as the beginning of the church or the beginning of anything in any meaningful sense, the disciples They see this moment as the end. The end they've been looking forward to and now they want their paychecks. They want whatever this reward has been that they were expecting when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus won this battle, whatever that battle might mean. They find themselves wrestling with the question, what does life look like now after Jesus? They are disciples. Disciples is from the Greek word for student or follower. They are the learning ones. They are the ones who are following the teacher, the leader. And for them, it was always a means to an end. Disciples for now, but one day something more. But what does discipleship mean if there's no one to follow? What does it mean to be a student when the leader, the teacher, is gone? We need to remember the whole story of God that we have been working our way through rather quickly these weeks of Lent, and in particular, the role of Christ in that story. The way that we often tell that story of Christ is that Jesus dropped down out of the sky to restore us to some kind of perfection, however we want to define that. And if that's why Jesus came, if that's his purpose, then our job is to get our ticket punched, and then we're set. Maybe we'll help some other people get their tickets punched too. But remember how much of God's story this version of Christ uh, neglects, overlooks. So much of what has come before it, it just doesn't matter. All the work that God has been doing and creating and investing and, and establishing the covenant relationship with God's people. Jesus didn't come to change the plot of the story. Jesus came to carry that plot forward, to advance the ongoing work in dramatic and new ways, to give us a new vocabulary for the work of God, calling it the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So Jesus is taking part in this long story, and then Jesus goes away. We call this the ascension, and Jesus ascends to heaven, and he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now this is, uh, what comes next is my favorite angelic interaction in all of Scripture. We have the disciples looking up to heaven where Jesus has just gone and vanished in a cloud, and suddenly men in white robes appear. And they say to these disciples, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? I think they're still wondering about that paycheck. I think they're asking each other, he's not really gone, right? He's not really going to just leave us here like this, right? They still think that they're going up too in some sort of, some way to be elevated, to be exalted. They're still expecting that reward. They're watching Jesus as if he's riding off into the sunset and 
credits are going to roll soon, and this great story is going to be wrapped up with a neat bow and a happy ending, especially for them, until these men in white robes appear. Maybe because they're staring up at the sky, and they say to the disciples, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? The disciples are looking in the wrong direction. Because God is still at work down here, even though Jesus has gone. There are more chapters to this story. There is still work to be done. And I think it's only when the question is put to them in that way that they begin to recognize the significance of Jesus' words to them. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If we're just staring up at heaven, waiting for our ride, there is no work to do. There's no power needed. It's just me and Jesus and my ticket home. But as soon as we cast our gaze at the world around us, as soon as we open our eyes to what is going on in this place, as soon as we begin to embrace God's call to us to participate in God's work in the world, then we see there's so much to be done. Then we see there is a need for strength that goes beyond our own. Paul talks a lot about this strength that we need in his letters. He talks about the strength of the church. He talks about the power given to the church by the Holy Spirit. It's given in the form of, of, a, of a variety, a multiplicity of gifts that we are in many ways and in different ways gifted by the Holy Spirit, but made one body, the body of Christ. And we see here from the very beginning that this power is given to the church for a very specific purpose, witness, witness. In the ancient world, when a new king or emperor came to power, this ruler would send out emissaries, heralds, messengers, testifiers, witnesses. They would go out into all the, the far-flung reaches of the realm, to all the subject peoples, to announce that there is a new ruler and to demand the allegiance of the people. This is life after Jesus. This is what life for the disciples looks like once Jesus is gone. The disciples become apostles. The learning ones become the sent ones. That is what apostle means, one who is sent. This is the task of the church, to be apostles, to be sent ones, to be witnesses. Not witnesses who shout far and wide that God is handing out tickets and that the train is leaving soon, but witnesses to the ancient ongoing work of God in the new vocabulary of the kingdom that Jesus has given to us. The east coast of Australia was settled in 1788. And soon after establishing a colony there, the people discovered that the land was, was inhospitable to agriculture. It turns out it was a great place to build a city. That is where Sydney uh, rests today, but it was a terrible place for a farm. And if it weren't for the steady supply of goods from England, these colonists would have starved to death. In 1791, a freed convict named James Roos asked the governor for a grant of land just outside of the colony there. And his goal was to use that land to establish the colony's first productive farm, a farm that could actually bring fruit from this arid landscape. This farm would be an indicator of whether this colony has any realistic hope of an independent future. He called his farm Experiment Farm. After several seasons and a lot of hard work, Roos finally produced a bumper harvest. And he renamed his farm. Instead of calling it Experiment Farm, he called it Model Farm. And his farm became a model for others to follow, a model that established the, the viability of this colony in that place. And it still stands today as a national monument in Australia. The church is not intended just to be an attractive building with compelling programs and hosts of Mildreds and Franks keeping the gossip mill going and the pastor busy. The church is an experiment. 
It's an experiment to see if we can keep our eyes fixed on the world to which God has called us. It's an experiment to see if the kingdom of God can find purchase in the soil of human hearts and in human community. It's an experiment to see if Mildred and Frank and you and me, as petty as we often are, can embody the covenant community that God has always desired for God's people. An experiment to see if we together can bear fruit in the world, producing goodness and beauty and not hoarding it for ourselves, to figure out how to carry on the work of Christ, the story of God, until it finds its completion. This is how we witness, how we herald, how we tell the world that there is a new king, that the new kingdom is coming. And maybe our little experiment, not a perfect experiment, but good and beautiful, maybe our little experiment can become a model of a new human community, a new way of living, a new way of being together, the living, breathing, and loving expression of Christ to the world. That is the church. Let us pray. We are all Mildred and Frank, oh God. We are all imperfect and flawed. And yet you have called us together to be part of the one body of Christ, the church. And you have invested us with gifts. You have equipped us to do the work of your kingdom. And so guide us and strengthen us, empower us and lead us so that we might grow into the church that you desire, the church that you need for this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.